on this week's episode of the Auto House Podcast. It's really nice to have the windows up and, and have a comfortable environment. You know, it's quieter. I always tell people that the other bonuses of air conditioning that you don't think about initially, the cool air is just one of them. The other one is not having the wind blowing on you. And every time a truck goes by or you go by a truck, it's so loud you can't hear and all of that you can't hardly talk you know once you can roll up the windows and have a more controlled environment it just makes for a lot more pleasant ride This is the Auto House Podcast. I've been trying to get someone from this company to talk with me on the podcast for a while now, and I thought I was just going to get some media representative, but ended up I got the vice president himself. Could you say your name and give yourself a short introduction? Uh, my name is Rick Love. I'm executive vice president here at Vintage Air, and I've uh, been here full time since 1998, so quite a few years. And uh, before that, I actually met Jack Chisenhall in the early 80s, our president, when I had a shop myself and I was doing hot rod wiring and AC installations. So I met him at that point and uh, we got to be friends and I started doing some shows with him through the years and then uh, finally come, ended up coming to work for him full time. And like I said, in 1998. So it's it's been a while, but I've been, you know, kind of associated with the company for quite some time. So, Rick, tell me, in my head, I get this image of a hot rodder, right? So a guy with a pack of cigarettes rolled up in his sleeves, like a loud, stinky car <laughs> with the windows down. In the early days, since uh, Vintage Air started in the late 70s, what was the initial impression for these guys when Vintage Air came out with a AC kit for, for their vehicles? Well, you know, back you make a good point. I mean, you know, when when a lot of us and in you know, I'm kind of one of what I would say one of the middle guys. You know, I'm I'm in my late fifties, and a lot of the guys that I've known in this industry, and and because I, I was a hot rodder too, or still am a hot rodder. I've got a couple old cars, and I've got a '39 Ford that I've had since 1984 when I built it the first time in a in a, in a one car garage at a house I was renting, and. It had 180 something thousand miles on it before I took it apart a few years ago and redid everything. So I've, and I, and it was everything from a daily driver to you know everything. So I'm, I'm I consider myself a hot rodder and always has been have been as well. So, you know, in the, in the when I say the early days, in you know in the 70s when when really this it, the modern street riding era as we know, you know, back you look at the 50s and 60s, things were a little bit different then. We kind of look at the modern era starting in the 70s when you started having more organized events and, you know, the first street rod nationals was in 1972. So kind of this modern era, you know, a lot of the guys were young then. You know, we were in our early 20s and, you know, mid 20s and early 30s and not too many guys thought about air conditioning their hot rods. I mean, a lot of them were resto rods then. You were pulling them out of junkyards or you were pulling them out of garages and building them. And we were more concerned about horsepower and going fast. And air conditioning was, was kind of something you took off a car. You didn't really add to a car. But as the guys started getting older and more of these events started popping up around the country, when you're traveling cross country, you know, if you're going 30 minutes to a local rod run or something, it's not too bad doesn't matter what the weather is you can kind of tough it out but as you start going halfway across the country or going multiple hours of driving it's really nice to have the windows up and and have a comfortable environment you know it's quieter i always tell people that the other bonuses of air conditioning that you don't think about initially the cool air is just one of them the other one is not having the wind blowing on you and every time a truck goes by or you go by a truck it's so loud you can't hear and all of that, you can't hardly talk. You know, once you can roll up the windows and have a more controlled environment, it just makes for a lot more pleasant ride of getting there. So guys started thinking about this and, and started pulling components out of cars and junkyards like we did most of the parts off hot rods then. You know, most of the, the parts you built the car from came from either a salvage yard or, you know, a wrecked car or something like that. And the problem with those parts off an OEM car was they were large, they were heavy, they were, you know, all of the things you associate in negative light with air conditioning. And uh, Jack Chisenhall, our founder, had basically started an aftermarket air conditioning company here near San Antonio where he was doing add-on systems for later model cars, Ford pickups, Dodge Darts, you know, the normal cars from a dealership that you would add air conditioning to if the factory didn't include it. But he was always a hot rodder. He always wanted to do hot rod air conditioning. So he took a lot of that technology, downsized it, 
made it more palatable for a hot rod, you know, started using lighter weight components, started using a compressor that didn't take as many horsepower as that big old lawnmower York compressor, you know, it was a lot smoother, you didn't have the vibration. So as as it became an easier system to package, the popularity started going up pretty quickly. One parallel I can draw about hot rodding from your era versus the golden era of hot rodding for me, so like the 90s and 2000s, is that Mm -hmm. at one point for us, it was feasible to go to the junkyard and do like you guys did where, um, you know, if I wanted a bigger engine or a different engine, I could go to the junkyard, pull one, or if I wanted to retrofit AC onto a a car that did not come with AC, I could go to the junkyard. But here we are, it's 2020, and... That's not quite feasible anymore to be like a no. junkyard hot rodder. No. You can't, I guess they don't even call them junkyards anymore. You know, I grew up around junkyards and loved it. Man, I had many a good afternoon finding some good old parts in a junkyard. But now I think they're salvage yards or pick and pull lots or anything. And it, it is harder, although, you know, there's still a lot of that going on. But, you know, I think one thing that changed for a lot of us, Ezekiel, and probably you're finding it out too, and a lot of the, the people you run around with, Back when I was younger, I had a lot of time. I didn't have any money, but I had a lot of time. And I could spend a whole day in a junkyard pulling something off and then a whole nother day trying to modify it a little bit to get it on my car and try to make it work with this component and that component. Well, now we all work so much more. There's so many other things going on that you don't have that time anymore. In addition to those yards not even being there, you just don't have so much of that time anymore. So boy, how great is it now to have access to some of these parts that you can just pick up the phone and call it and have the truck deliver it to your house. And it's a lot more bolt-in, in, you know, bolt-in type application where you're not spending all that extra time. You know, the time you spend on it, you're making progress with it. I think that had a lot to do with these companies springing up. And, you know, seeing the work you're doing on on the cars you're working on, I mean, look what you can do now. I mean, when we were making compressor brackets years ago, we started out with a piece of cardboard and, and parts, and we would draw that part, and we'd kind of out of cut it out of cardboard, and then you'd either hand cut it or cut it with a torch out of a piece of metal, and then you'd weld these parts together and everything. And now, I mean, you can design these parts in CAD, you can 3D print them to see how everything's going to work, and then you can laser cut them all like we do here in-house. You know, we can go straight from CAD design to laser cut parts and bend those parts, and you can produce a a really nice part in a short amount of time that way. You give me too much credit. I So um, before this, I know we talked about how you've made compressor brackets through, you know, old school CAD, so cardboard aided design. <laughs> and, and, exactly. Uh, yeah. That's exactly right. <laughs> the compressor bracket, I actually made the prototype. I I'm pretty much did the same thing, cardboard aided design, but I'm really fortunate. I saw it on your YouTube oh, video. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what you did. I did. I watched that and that's much the same as we did it for years. The the next step though was you you had it scanned or you worked that so you could do it in in, in three print three D printed the next step. So I mean that's 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 the way you make nicer parts for sure. One other thing that I've gotten, I don't know if pushback is the right word for it in uh, trying to retrofit this kit to the uh, A86 chassis is that Mm -hmm. potential consumers will say like uh, hit up the junkyard. But I mean, you made the point where, you know, junkyard might not be as feasible because, you know, all of us, time is such an important commodity for us. And then the second thing, buying these old OEM parts, not only are they extremely difficult to find now? Um, a lot of this stuff is discontinued in the States. And the, the other part of that is a lot of this stuff, which you briefly touched on with the AC compressor designs, is that a lot of this stuff, um, technology has improved to the point where, you know, all this stuff, like the condensers and the compressor are all, all uh, antiquated technology at this point. Yep. If, if you're dealing with components that were designed around R12, you know, late 80s, early 90s components that were designed around R, R12, those components are designed to work with R12. And, you know, you think about it, a 1990 car now is 30 years old. Oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> that technology has changed quite a bit in 30 years. Look at the, you know, you're, you're probably not running the same induction systems or the same ignition control in those cars that you did back then. And you know, a lot of those parts, if you're getting out of a junkyard, they've been there 25 years. 
you don't know what condition they're in. You don't know how they're going to work. And man, I've seen more guys do that over the years. They'll pull some parts out of a car and they'll get something working and it'll work for two months and all of a sudden they're having problems with it because either the oil was contaminated or you have some internal degradation of the parts. You know, you have, you, you can get all kinds of corrosive things happening inside an AC system and that'll cause you problems down the road. And it's just, and a lot of them also are heavy and, you know, and you're seeing this as, as well with your stuff, but I think that the, the difficulty in finding these parts, it's got to be harder all the time because I'll bet the majority of those cars were not air conditioned when they came over here, were they? So the particular trim we work on, they came factory with air conditioning, but I think the biggest okay. reason why all the air conditioning is missing out of these cars is because... At the heyday of these cars, everyone took it out to hot rod these cars out. Yep. <laughs> That's why all the air conditioning is missing is because people yep. like me took them very out. Very similar to our market. Yep. You know, very similar to our market. I mean, you know, again, it was weight. It was things you didn't use. In a lot of cases, it wasn't functional. So, yeah, that was one of the first things we ripped out of those cars. Very similar to what, to, what your guys are doing. So, a part of updated technology with Vintage Air's product line. One thing that really fascinated me was the Superflow condensers. Can you talk a little bit about those? Well, you know, when you talk about different refrigerants, you know, you don't even talk about R12 much anymore because that was phased out in 1995. So 25 years ago, that was phased out. But R12 and, and currently 134A, and even if you look at YF, 1234, which is what a lot of the new cars are using that are used globally because that's a globally accepted refrigerant. They're all, you know, refrigerants all do the same thing. They just have different properties. And the properties of R12 were a little different from the properties of 134A. R12 and 134A, the molecule size is much different. You look at a lot of the old R12 systems or all of them, basically, they all had flare fittings, which was, you know, a metal to metal contact, which worked pretty well with the molecule size with R12. But once you got to 134A, the molecules of 134A were much smaller than R12. So you had to design fittings, or they were around anyway, but we had to go to O-ring fittings because you needed that O-ring seal to keep that refrigerant from leaking out of the system. So that was one major difference when you went to 134A. 134A is an excellent refrigerant. It absorbs heat inside the car really well, and it carries heat really well. Those two properties make it a little more reluctant to give up the heat, and you give up the heat in, outside your car in the condenser. You know, the way that your, your AC system works, and it basically you're using a refrigerant that circulates through the system. It evaporates inside the vehicle, and when it evaporates, it absorbs heat, and then you pull that refrigerant out, and you compress it, push it through the condenser, and in the condenser, it condenses from a gas to a liquid. And when it does that, it dissipates its heat. It gives up its heat. And then you have that high-pressure liquid going back into the evaporator where the whole cycle starts over again. And the condenser is where you give up the heat. And the tube and fin to get condensers, the old tube and fin condensers, basically, you know, with anytime you're going to transfer heat, and I always use this example because it's it's really clear, you know, if, if you're going to transfer heat, if you just take your finger and you hold it over a warm stove or a cold window in your house on a, on a cold day or a warm window on a warm day, you can feel the, the temperature outside through the window. Now, if it's a double pane, it's obviously a little, a little different, but on a single pane window, but when you touch the window, that's when you really feel the temperature difference because that, that temperature difference is transferring. So, your molecules of refrigerant, as they're circulating through that condenser, you want them to touch the surface of the condenser. That's when they're going to give up their heat the best. The old tube and fin condensers with the big old tubes in them, a lot of those molecules as they went through that condenser never got to the outside of it, so they had a little hard, harder time giving up their heat. So the, the solution to that was to use a larger condenser. You see a lot of the early cars with 134A and Suburbans and everything, they went to a larger condenser to get the refrigerant to work properly or work efficiently. In, you know, in a Toyota or a smaller car or a hot rod, you don't have unlimited grill capacity. You've got a small amount of grill capacity there, so you've got to have a more efficient heat exchanger rather than a lar larger heat exchanger. And the way the, the superflow or the parallel flow condensers work is instead of having that big old tube, you have a more oblong tube that has passages within it. And by doing that, you've dramatically in increased the surface area and more surface area, more heat transfer. The heat goes from the molecule 
to the tube, from the tube to the fin, and then the cooler air flowing across that fin takes the heat away. So that's, that's the big advantage. You get more efficiency in the same size package. I was kind of a run-on sentence to it, basically, or run-on description, but that's, that's where you're gaining that efficiency is you've, you've increased the surface area dramatically. Perfect. That was actually a great explanation. And one other question to tag onto that is um, reading straight out of the Vintage Air brochure. So the condenser mm -hmm. should be matched to the compressor that is properly sized for the rest of the system. So how do I decide what size condenser I need? When it comes to a condenser, the condenser, like we just talked about, that's where you dissipate your heat. So I, my rule of thumb is you want to use the largest condenser you can possibly fit. You want to cover as much as your radiator core area as you can. The larger the condenser, the more capacity it's going to have to dissipate the heat. The same with the evaporator inside the car. That evaporator is what's going to absorb the heat inside the car. So you want to always use the largest evaporator that you can as well, because the larger the evaporator, the more coil capacity it has, the more ability it has to absorb heat inside the vehicle, the quicker you're going to pull down the temperature inside the vehicle. You know, so that's that's the key, the largest of, them, of both of them. The compressor, you don't want to have too much compressor for the size of the condenser you have because all you're going to do is build up a lot of pressure and, and not be able to not be able to, to get rid of the, the heat, which causes the pressure to increase. You know, if your condenser is too small, the compressor is just going to keep building pressure and you're not going to get rid of it. So mm. you want to size the compressor to the condenser and to the evaporator. It's a system. That's, that's one of the most important things about air conditioning to remember is it's, it's a system. No different than a brake system in a car. You know, many times in, in hot riding as guys, you know, we've seen it in the past, especially when pro touring came and everything. Boy, I'd see guys, they'd put a, a six piston caliper and 14 inch rotors and everything on their Camaros and expected to have great stopping capacity. But if you didn't use the correct bore master cylinder when you were doing that or the correct line, you didn't get the performance out of it. You didn't get that optimal performance out of it because you had to match each component of the system to work properly. You had to have the right size bore master cylinder to move the right amount of fluid to engage those calipers. And it's the same way with an air conditioning system. You want to have the right size evaporator matched to the compressor, matched to the condenser so that you're going to get the efficient operation of that air conditioning system. Yeah, comparing the AC system to the brake system as a unit, that was actually a great comparison. I That really helped me understand it. It is. It's a system. And again, it's like so many things. When you're building a hot rod, we got spoiled in, in the 90s and even beyond because, man, the OEM started building some really, really good cars. You know, I mean, if if you had a car from the 60s compared to what, the, and even the 70s compared to the 80s and 90s, the sophistication level and the engineering in those cars changed dramatically. You know, we, we all got spoiled by that. You know, the brake systems are so much better. The, the All of that, the electronic systems are so much better and everything. And that comes from modernization, from people understanding, the engineers understanding, and treating everything as a system. These questions about our... R134A and then the condenser, this is all leading up to what's this kind of trend I've been seeing, not even in the Bay Area, but in all of California, where we have this 25-year importation law. So we can, right. we can only uh, import foreign vehicles 25 years and older. And this has been a big trend right now. Is that right a now. law now? Has that been passed and signed into law there? Oh, yeah. That's uh, for quite a while now. So, I mean, most uh, most popular is that Nissan Skyline. Uh, people are waiting for uh, right. the years to go right. on to, so we can get the uh, R34, the newest one. <laughs> and uh, That's a cool car. Man, oh, yeah. those are great cars. <laughs> yeah, totally agree. Great cars. I had the opportunity to drive a GTR years ago when I was in Japan, one of the original GTRs. And um, other than the steering wheel being on the right side and everything, it, it was <laughs> being a little different <laughs> over there. That was that was a really impressive car. And, and the thing that impressed me the most about it at that time was how well balanced it was. Not only did it have great acceleration, it had great brakes, it had great neutral handling. I mm. mean, it was that was one of the first early to me kind of supercar import cars, and and how well they balanced that whole performance system on that car. Yeah. So what I'm trying to get at is with more of these cars coming into California or even the United States, um, future thinking for me is doing 134A conversions on these cars. You know, the, the, if you're going to do a 134A conversion, and we, we've talked about this, 
you know, this is a little behind what we did. We got into these conversions back in the 90s, you know, when, when things, when 134 became necessary here after 1995. What The right way to do a conversion to me, and when I had my little shop, the way I would do it, I, I didn't do a half conversion. If I was going to do it, I did a super, super flow condenser. I went through and went to O-ring fittings throughout, and that meant in a lot of cases changing the expansion valve on the system which in some of those cars is probably easier than it was in some of the early American cars, but and flushing out the old mineral oil and going to an ester oil, you know, because in an air conditioning system, the oil circulates with the refrigerant. So you've got to make sure that you have like oils, mineral oil and what we call PAG oil, polyalkaline glycol, which is what most modern systems use. PAG oil doesn't play well with, with the old mineral oil. You start getting some real real problems within the system if they get aggressive with each other. So if you're going to be doing conversions, you need to be concerned about what oil you're doing on the conversion and everything. And, you know, once you get into all of that, it becomes a more complex thing. I've always been a believer now it's going to get harder as time goes on, especially in the California area. You know, if you've got a system designed for R12 and you want to restore that system like that, get some R12 and put it in there if it's possible. Now, again, out in California, that's a lot more difficult thing than it is in other other areas of the country. But if you if you are going to be doing a conversion on some of these cars, that's the thing that people have to keep in mind, that it's not just changing the ports and dumping 134A into a system that was designed for R12, because you're going to be disappointed in the performance of that system. Yeah, and to build on that, I know I've seen some other privateer companies build comprehensive kits based on Mm -hmm. or using vintage air products. What comes to mind is especially like all the Datsun guys. And um, I've seen one kit where they have is just engine bay only. So they retain Mm -hmm. the factory evaporator. And yep, they're probably doing just what we talked about. They're probably putting a new condenser on it and new hoses and this just basically keeping the, the factory evaporator everything inside the car they're keeping the same i see yeah especially with these foreign cars which we these engines and these components we have never got here in the states a lot of these parts you know compressors the lines not only are they probably discontinued because these cars are 25 years old but i mean even sourcing how many months you have to wait for this part to for some guy to find this part in japan right yeah right and again you're dealing with that same thing that's a 30 year old car over there you know, they're they're obsoleting those parts more every year. And that's where I think specialized company, like you mentioned with some of the, the Datsun people and, and some of the Toyota people and everything, when that's the kind of car you work with all the time, it's easy for you to put a kit together to help other guys that are doing that. You know, and hey, for us, it, it's a little more difficult because we don't have those cars available to us here to even do a lot of that fitment on. So that's where more niche companies really can shine on that because, man, that's all they do. They work on that one brand of car, and that's all they do, and they know what's going to work well with it. And it makes it easy for them to use some of our our components, some of our builder series or universal components, and, and put together those components in a way to make that system work efficiently in that car. One thing we talked about previously was that seeing how these cars that were once, you know, hot rotted out, I would say the import market is shifting more towards the restoration side. And part of that, when I was planning on building AC kit for these cars, is actually the the head unit for the climate control. So in these cars, they're cable activated. And one thing that really intrigues me, because a lot of these owners said, like, I don't want to lose my, you know, my cable, a- the OEM climate control unit is uh, the digital cable converters from Vintage Air. Can you talk a little bit about those? If you can, depending on the package area you have available under the dash, on some of those cars it's tighter than others, if you can use our Gen 4 system, uh, which is a more digital electronically controlled system, it has an ECU, if you have a cable-operated control, then we designed and patented what we call cable converters. And it's basically a slide pot that bolts in, screws in, where your cable originally screwed in. So then you can replace your cable with this slide potentiometer. So now you're converting that mechanical lever operation into an electronic signal. And then that signal can be fed to our ECU. And by going through a calibration process after you've got everything installed, you teach the ECU what the stroke of that lever is. It learns it. 
and basically sends that to the doors so you get full door control with your controls. So that's completely possible in a lot of cases with our Gen 4 system. Now, with the Gen 2, the earlier Gen 2 system, that's an analog controlled system that uses mechanical switches with a five volt signal. That one's a little more difficult to do any conversion for that. In a case like that, you're almost forced to take one of our control panels and basically put it where the factory control is, convert it to put it where the factory control is. So that's that's kind of the trade-off on those two type of systems. As long as you're doing a Gen 4, in some cases, in many cases, you can convert that original control panel if it was cable operated, and you can convert it over to electronic operation. So are these cable converters compatible with all the uh, the contained units? So like the the compact and the mini, as well as uh, like the Magnum, are these cable converters compatible with all these units? At this point, no. The electronics of the Magnum is the only one that the cable converters are compatible with. Oh, okay. The Gen 2 series, the Mini, the Compact, the Super, the Gen 2 series is the analog electronics, and that's that's more of a switched 5-volt signal to move the doors, and it has a 3-speed blower control for the 3-speed blower on the on the fan. So that one's that one's very difficult to convert a factory control panel into electronic operation with that series. Again, you with that one you'd almost you're almost locked into using one of the control panels we have and fabricating some type of adapter to put it into the factory location. So the goal to me is always in any system that you can to use the Gen 4 if possible, but it's also a little larger case unit. So there's some there's some packaging limitations that can be overcome by going to the Gen 2 series system. And you've gone through that with the projects that you're doing. You just can't fit a Magnum in there. Yeah, that was disappointing to hear. I really wanted to make that cable converter happen. But I mean, exactly like you said, um, on these, a lot of these cars, especially the one um, I primarily have in the shop, it's a tight squeeze down there under the dash. Yep. <laughs> yeah, there's not, there's not a lot of package space in there. There's really not. There's not a lot of package space. Through the years, I've seen a lot of really neat, things done with some of our universal control panels to to kind of put them in the factory location where they can look really cool. But again, that's that's one of those where it takes that's some of these companies that deal in these cars, like there's there's one guy I know that makes a GTO control for years ago he made a GTO control that basically took one of our universal controls and put it into a factory GTO housing and everything. Now we've done a sure fit for the GTO and a Gen 4, so that's not needed anymore. But it was something that he did years ago and and made it much easier for the average guy to be putting some of these aftermarket systems in their car. One other topic that I've commonly heard you speak about in other podcasts that um, probably your average everyday consumer doesn't even think about is the importance of insulation. And I'll premise this with a fun story. So in our cars, these A86 Corollas, the header routes right under your left foot. So it's a common <laughs> yeah. uh, running joke that uh, your Chuck Taylors, or if you're wearing some sandals, they'll get melted on that on the left <laughs> side. Yeah. Well, yeah, again, this is this is something we learned with hot rodders years ago. I mean, you know, we were dealing with a whole lot of these cars that were made initially in the 30s and 40s sometimes. You know, they'd been sitting around in fields, so they had rusty floorboards and or no floorboards in some cases, you know, and all of that. And it's once you, you, you grasp the concept that an air conditioner doesn't make cold air, that it takes the air from an enclosed area and you run it across the coil, you pull it in through the blower, run it across the coil, and you absorb the heat out of that air, and then you blow that air with a lack of heat back onto the the occupants, that's not a magic box that's making cold air. It's an evaporator that's that's removing the heat from the air that's inside the vehicle. If you can't keep the hot air out, the best air conditioner in the world it isn't going to keep your car cool. You know, this is I've got a son that just turned 25. I mean, and so he's he's grown up now. But when he was a kid, we used to run into these same things at the house. You know, it's it's the middle of summer here in San Antonio. It's 100 degrees. And my wife is telling me that the air conditioning's not working real well in the house. Well, come to find out, my son left the door open here oh. or the window <laughs> open or something like that. And, you know, you can't air condition South Texas. And it's the same way in your vehicle. If you can't keep the hot air out, you're not going to be able to cool the car. And sealing and insulating are, are 
two of the most important things to making your air conditioner work well. You know, the advantage you have with a lot of these cars is many of them came with a tinted window, so that that obviously helps. The more more heat you can reflect out through the windows, but and also the door seals in those Toyotas and in some of those were far superior to what the early Fords and Chevrolets had for sure. So, I mean, when you get your door seals working right, you get all the holes filled on your floors. We started carrying about two years ago a product called Lizard Skin, which is a spray-on insulation. And you spray it to a few mils of thickness, and the heat and sound deadening, the, the sound deadening and heat reflectivity on it is excellent. And, I mean, we've also used Dynamat as a sound deadener, and then you can put the foam, the Dynaliner foam on top of that, the closed cell foam. And all of those products, when used properly, make a huge difference. But you've got to be able to seal that heat from the outside out before any air conditioning system is going to work or heating system is going to work efficiently within within your vehicle guy yeah, if you're if you're burning your sandal or you're you're melting the sole of your tennis shoe on the floor you can bet that air conditioner is going to have to work really really hard to try to make you comfortable in that car and you know when i had my shop i used to and this is something i always tell people about too a great way to see what kind of leaks you may have is to take a real bright, bright, now you can use LED lights. I used to use fluorescent lights, but I would stick one of those lights up under the dash and then shut off the lights in the garage and open the hood and just start looking to see if you could see light anywhere. If somebody had lost a seal or there was a hole in the day and that you didn't quite see, boy, if you saw light coming through it, that means heat's going to go in through it. And I would do the same thing. I would put put one on the floor and tear up things and see if you had light coming in. Anywhere light was coming in, you could bet heat was going to come in. And that that's the key to making your system work efficiently. Again, if you can't, I can't say it enough times, if you can't seal the heat out, there's no way you're going to make that car cool and comfortable inside. You know, it's like running around with the windows down with the air conditioning on. Yeah, it may help a little bit, but you're certainly not going to get comfortable. Switching gears a little bit, because I always like to ask companies or people who have been in the industry for multiple decades and, you know, have deep roots in it. So surviving the 08 recession, what did that period of time look like for Vintage Air? And then how did Vintage Air pull out of it? You know, we were very fortunate. We've been very fortunate through the years that we've never really hit bottom or anything like that. You know, we don't make, and we we talk about this as a company all the time. You know, we don't build a single product here that's an I need product. Everything we have here is an I want product. And even in recessions, people are very reluctant to give up their hobbies or the things that they do for fun. They may have to trim back a little bit. We all do. But you don't want to give up what you do as a release or for fun or or things like that. That always tends to retain a place in your heart and you're not just going to back away from it easily. So we've been very fortunate. We try to keep our systems as priced as it is effectively as we possibly can. And, you know, we also recognize that most of our, our customers are just working guys like us, you know, and, and this system that they buy, they save up for for a while. But we also try to keep our the way our systems are set up. You can buy one part of our system and not have to buy everything today. You know, if you just want to get the compressor mounted on your engine to begin with, or you want to get the condenser mounted in front of the radiator, you can buy all of those parts individually and start working toward having the whole system finish. And I think that always helps as well. But it, it seems like, you know, the automotive industry, certainly the aftermarket industry, seem on all of that. We certainly had a downturn even in 08 and 09 and, and everything, but it wasn't a, it wasn't just a complete death knell by any, by any stretch of the imagination, which, which we're all very proud of. I think we, again, nobody's recession proof, but, but I think we're recession resistant because everybody that works on their car is passionate about what they do. It's, it's important to them. I'm curious because I know a lot of these import tuning companies actually went under during that 08 recession. And, you know, a lot of what I've heard is like exactly what you said. This is a I want, not an I need. So when uh, when you're cash strapped, you're, uh, you know, a lot of times your hobbies have to as much as you love them. Sometimes they have to be given up or put on the back burner. And so I'm curious, is there what you know, Mm -hmm. Ezekiel, a lot of those import tuning companies, man, they started out and they grew dramatically really quick. You know, mm. that, that growth was very quick, and their customer base was 
a lot, in a lot of cases, the youngest guys in the group. Mm, okay. And so when that, when that recession hit, you know, if, if you're dealing with some of the older, uh, the more mature guys, as I would say, and I, I hate to say older guys all the time, <laughs> but you know, um, you know, I, I definitely have a little more spendable income now than I did when I was 20 years old or 22 years old. You know, when I first built my 39, man, I, I remember I used to travel more than for a living with a job I had then, and I would get a per diem per day. I'd get $25 a day to eat. And when I was building my car, I would take a loaf of bread and a jar of peanut butter with me, and that would be my lunch and dinner some days, and I would find a hotel that had a free breakfast. So mm. I, could, I could pocket $20 a day or so generally out of my per diem money because building my car was more important, you know? So again, when I was you know, 22, 23 years old, that that was what I did so that I could keep keep doing my hobby and everything. But I think that's why that a lot of those tuner companies suffered more than say some of the companies that relied on somewhat older and more more seasoned guys to be their support group because the the younger guys felt that quicker. I think now you know there's no way to determine that for sure, but that's just we we've talked about that before, and I think that's why you saw that a little more was a little more prevalent with some of those companies. And again, they grew so quickly; it's it's, it's very hard to maintain huge growth like that. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Can we get a sneak peek? Does Vintage Air have any future products or new SureFit applications in the pipeline? Yep, we're working on again. Some of these are older cars. We just released the uh, '73 to '79. Ford uh, F Series pickup system, and also the seventy eight seventy nine Bronco on those same things. That's that's the most recent kit. We're finishing up now sixty five, sixty six Impalas, the full size Chevrolets and stuff. But then another product line that we've been working on a lot that we've just started releasing for is new brushless fans, and we're doing more brushless fan kits for cars. And I am a I'm a huge reliever now in brushless fan operation. You know, that's what all the OEMs are using now. And, you know, we've used electric fans for years. And the advantage of an electric fan over an engine-driven fan is, you know, an engine-driven fan, when you need it the most, it's the least efficient. When you're idling, when you're going slow in traffic, your engine RPMs are at their absolute least. And that's when you need the most cooling capacity. So an engine-driven fan is difficult in a lot of ways. But back in the late 80s, early 90s, the efficiency of the electric fans were not that great. And it was hard to have an electric fan as your primary cooling fan. But with the advent of many of the foreign cars and even the American cars that went to a transverse mounted engine transmission, well, now you didn't have an engine sitting longitudinally in your car to run a fan. You had to rely on electric fan as your primary cooling fan. So that helped fan development tremendously get better through the years. And now that we're going to these brushless fans, the brushless fans, they have the ability to operate with, with PWM, with pulse width modulation operation. So instead of just being an on-off fan, it's variable in speed. So you can vary the fan speed to the to the load, to the heat load that you're trying to compensate for on the car which is a huge difference because even with an electric fan in the past you know you'd put it in an engagement signal say at 190 degrees on your engine so when your engine got to 190 degrees the electric fan would turn on and you would bring your engine temperature back to about 180 and then the electric fan would kick off and then your engine temperature would creep back up again and when it got to 190 it would turn the fan on again well with a brushless fan in a controller it basically when you hit a certain temperature, depending on what the computer's dialed in for, it starts to span the fan spinning slowly, and it only spins up to the RPM that it needs to to maintain that engine temperature and maintain the AC operating pressure. So you're not running that fan all the time on all the way on high, and also you tend to maintain these engine temperatures at a more level operating temperature rather than going up and down and up and down responding to that load. So, man, and just the performance out of these brushless fans, too, is just amazing in comparison to what the old the old early electric fans would do. So that's been that's been one of our biggest pushes with with new technology is getting these brushless fans brought into the aftermarket because it's an OEM fan. And now we're using a small fan. We have a 500 watt 16 inch fan and we have an 850 watt 19 inch fan which is a, just a bruiser of a fan. And, <laughs> you know, they'll, 
Heck, no hard. They, you know, they earned a fifty watt. I swear, you could pull your car with that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> really, those those brushless fans is another new product line that we we've, we've dedicated a lot of our resources to. And down the road a ways, we've got some new electronics coming out. That's that's going to be a step forward as well, incorporating some of the technologies we've worked with with GT. You know, we we do the AC system. We did the design and the manufacturing for the AC system for the for the Ford GT, both the 2002 to 2007, and the new GT. So we've taken some of the lessons and some of the things that we've done with that, and we're going to bring that into the aftermarket as well. Yeah, that's exactly the next question I want to ask. So working with Ford Motor Company on both of the Ford GTs. That was a great experience, has been a great experience for you, uh, for us. And um, I actually was, was our program manager on the original Ford GT. I say the original, the, the 2000s one, not the original back in the 60s. But And that was really, we had worked with OEMs before, not not the huge ones, but some of the OEMs, Panaz and Celine and a couple of the others. And then we got in with the GT and actually worked, worked with Ford itself. And it, it enabled us to work with the OEMs and have access to some of their testing facilities and some of the, you know, some of the design people there. And it, it helped move us forward in our thinking as well on our systems. So, in fact, the, the Gen 4 Magnum uses the exact same stepper motors to control the doors that are on the Ford GT. We had started developing those stepper motors for our own systems. And then when the GT project came to us with a really tight timeline, since we already had the the electronics developed for that, we moved that into that. And it was an OEM stepper motor, basically was used in BMWs and a couple other European cars. So basically some of that same technology is on there. The control panel for the for the old Ford GT is basically a hot rod control panel. They liked the way we were lighting through the knobs on some of these hot rod control panels that we had. They liked it so much that they incorporated it into that GT, which is kind of a, a cool deal to see. So it's it's been really good for us to, again, be able to tap into some of that testing facilities and some of the some of that that you don't as an aftermarket company have access to any other way. So it was, it, it's been a great learning experience for us. And again, it's, it's, it's given us some lessons and some, some foresight and, and we're going to be incorporating more of that OEM technology as we continue to grow. Yeah. That's one thing that really impressed me when I was first doing my research for a aftermarket AC retrofit was that Vintage Air works with OEMs. And on a previous one of your podcasts, I've even heard that you guys are working with uh, supercar manufacturers, so specifically Koenigsegg. Yep, we do the the system for Koenigsegg. We've also done engineering for some of the other systems that we can't say, but some of the other supercars and everything, we've done engineering and some production work for them and some others that that we know about now that we're involved with that are going to be some pretty amazing cars coming out as well. And, And we have a unique ability to do that because, you know, we're not interested in making a million systems for a Ford Taurus or something like that. But some of these supercar companies that are going to build 100 a year, 150 a year, we can provide them with OEM level design and engineering at a much more attractive price point than, say, GM or Ford or Delphi, some of those, you know, larger companies can. So it's been it's been a real good part of our business through the years. So factory tours, open house and dealer training for Vintage Air? Well, you know, this COVID thing has changed a lot of that. We up until the COVID hit this year, we we had quite a few factory tours. If somebody was coming by, you know, we had we welcomed people to come to the plant. We'd give them a factory tour and everything. Right now, we've we've kind of kept the plant closed down until this whole COVID thing blows over and we get back to a little more more normal way of doing things. Uh, every year we have an open house. Unfortunately, this year we in 2020 we ended up canceling it. We postponed it once. We normally have them in May. And uh, we we postponed it till September, and then ended up canceling it all together just because of the uh, the crowd size. We weren't allowed to have a crowd size that large in San Antonio, and it wouldn't have been probably the prudent thing to do anyway. But we have an open house that usually draws two to two hundred fifty cars and locals, and it's a great way for our employees to show their families what they do and and how they work here and everything, and and also 
you know, we'll get people from as far away from Dallas and Houston come for our open house as well. It's always a fun deal. We've got a bunch of old race cars there. We fire up some old dragsters and it's a, it's a fun deal and it's a way for us to open our doors and, and give people a look behind the scenes that they may not normally get. So now we just kind of have a, a virtual video tour online available so you can kind of see through our facility. But we're we're very proud of what we do here. We're very vertically integrated. We do our own heater cores here. We do our own tube and fin AC and heat coils. You know, we do so much. We have our own CNC laser and press break and machine shop. We do our own powder coating in-house. I mean, we do very, very much do all our own plastic molds, our own plastic molding in-house and everything. So we're a very self-contained company, and we do as much as our own manufacturing here as we can. And we're always anxious to show that off because, you know, I'm going to tell you, at heart, we're all hot rodders here. From Jack, our president, to a whole lot of the people that work here, we're car people as well. And our we all, we always joke about it sometimes. I shouldn't say we joke about it, but we talk about it, that Again, we never lose sight of the fact of who our customers are and the fact that we're not building an I need product. We build an I want product. And several times a year, the, the people will tell you here about my, my what I call my Christmas morning speech. And we, we talk about it, you know, that a lot of our customers, you know, they save up their, their extra money to buy a vintage air system or to buy parts from us and everything else. And, you know, when they open that box that they've saved up for and ordered, it's it's Christmas morning because that's how it is for me when I order parts for my car, you know. And those those kits need to be built with quality. They need to look right. They need to be packaged right because that first impression is so important. And then that system has to work as it's intended to work. And we we never lose sight of that. That's such a driving force behind what we do here all the time. And and our people, our people are very we're ISO nine thousand one certified, and so we have to be audited every year for that. And it's it's always great for me to hear from our auditor the, that they'll they'll audit a Ford plan or they'll audit a lot of these other plants. And and they always tell me that one of the things that sets us apart from from those is the people here don't look at this as a job. They you know they really care about what they do. And that's always great for us to hear. What about training for dealers? One thing that I really miss about being a former dealership technician is the factory training. And I've seen in the uh, in the catalog that um, you do you guys do offer dealer training. So when's the next next dealer training? (laughs) We have a distributor conference once every two years. Uh, In fact, we just had one in February right before all this COVID stuff, actually, where we invite dealers in and our distributors in, and we set up basically a one-day product seminar where we go over our product line in depth and and talk about what we do, talk about new products. And then we have a half-day training session, technical training session, where we talk about a lot of things that you and I did earlier today, just how AC works. And, you know, Proper mounting of the components. We have a couple cars there. We have our test stand there, and we, and we give our dealers some training on that. At this point, and also in that in that um, distributor conference, we invite some of our partner companies that I'm very comfortable with and that we're very comfortable with to come in and do seminars as well, a couple hour seminars. And it's a great way to to spread knowledge on some of these other companies. Like like last year or this year, actually, we had Classic Instruments, we had Bowler Transmissions, and we've had. Ride Tech in the past, and we've had some of these other companies, Detroit Speed and Engineering, they'll come in and do a seminar as well. So you get some other, a way to gain knowledge about some of these other companies and not just about their products, but they always are educational sessions on suspension and design theory and everything like the Detroit Speed and Classic Instruments when they do their gauges. They also talk about the electronic aspect of it and all of that. So we, we try to do the training in that. At this point, it's really hard to have like installation training here because we're not an installation center. We have vehicles here in our research and development department, but they're here for that. They're for here for kit development. So it's not like we're bringing cars in all the time and doing installations and everything where we can we can actually train guys. So that's a little more difficult for us, but it, the distributor conference has been very successful through the years for us. Last question for you, Rick. So again, back when I was doing research, um, what company or what components would I need to retrofit a new AC system into a classic vehicle or maybe a vehicle that never came with AC? 
There's a lot of companies out there and I feel like there's a lot of competition and there's also a lot of imitators. So what separates Vintage Air from its competition? Well, you know, the first thing I think of when when I'm asked that question is his people, because it doesn't matter if what your company is, it all comes down to the people that you have there. That's what drives it. And because the people drive you to stay up with the latest technology, the people drive you to be striving for excellence every day. And I'm really proud of the people we have here because that's, that is what separates us because without those people, we wouldn't be constantly looking at the technology. How, how can we improve our technology? What are we looking at for the next step forward? But by the same token, to use an old cliche, I think the fact that our people are hot rodders, that we're car guys too, is, is a huge part of who we are because every one of us, I, I drove to work today. I've got a 66 El Camino that I've had for 25 years. That's what I drive to work today. It has a vintage air system in it. I drive it several times a week to work and back. So the system I have in that truck is in my daily driver, basically. So I'm a user of our systems as well as I am in design, in the design process and the engineering process and the sales process. So it gives me a real feel for how our systems operate on a daily basis in the fact that our president, Jack, is the same way. He's a hot rodder. He has several old cars with our systems in it. And I think it starts at the top with him. Is, is He's been doing this so long since 1976. It's, he's still just as passionate about it today as he was when he started the company. And he's always challenging us to what's the next step? Where do we got to be? Brushless fans is a, first, is, a, is a complete example of that. When Everybody else is just running regular electric fans. We need to be getting into these brushless fans because that's what the OEMs have done. There's a reason for it. And I think that's that's one of the biggest things that separates us. I'm also proud of the fact that we have a, a dedicated technical department where we have basically five guys that are there to answer questions either electronically through email or on the phone every day. And our sales staff is is very good as well to answer questions. And so we try to provide both information when you're thinking about a project and then any kind of support you need after that. Yeah, you totally reminded me. That was the one thing that I was extremely impressed with was the staff of Vintage Air. So just talking with the sales guy, talking with the national sales manager, even with technical support, I think after every one of those phone calls, I'd be in shock. Like, wow, that was a really nice guy. I can't believe it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we are. I I brag on our guys because I'm proud of our guys because they are good guys. And none of these guys just look at it as a job. I mean, they really care about what they do. And because, you know, we do anywhere from 20 to 25 shows a year on most given years. Now, this year it was obviously less because of COVID, but these are the guys that are out there face-to-face with these customers. And, and, you know, when you're out seeing your customers face-to-face, you want to make sure they've got a good experience with your company. And that's very important to us. Well, Rick, we are just at our one hour mark and I just want to, you know, sincerely thank you so much again for your time to come speak with us on the podcast. And it's definitely been such a pleasure and such a privilege to be able to speak with you. Well, I've enjoyed it. Always enjoy it. And I'll tell you, we're looking forward to getting more involved with what you do and the customers you have, because, you know, the younger guys like y'all, that's the future. That's the future of our hobby here. And I got to tell you one quick story that before we go is I went to the drag races a couple of weeks ago and uh, it was a test and tune night. And there was a group of younger guys there that had a mid 80s Mazda with um, a rotary engine and a turbo on it. And they're getting ready for there's a big import drag race here this, this coming weekend. They were practicing for it and had a three rotor rotary in there with a, a large turbocharger on it. And I watched them run. And that car ran a 740 in the quarter mile. Oh, my God. <laughs> a little short wheelbase Mazda and about 158 miles an hour. And I went and talked to him afterwards. I was so impressed. I mean, it sounded fabulous, really well-built car and everything, and just a great young group of guys. And I really enjoyed watching them run that car. And just the technology, again, they were running 55 pounds of boost in that. Yep. And they said they'll crank it up to 60 for the race. Oh, my God. Full billet block (laughs) and everything for this three rotor. And the technology was just so impressive to me and how well those guys were dialing it in and everything. I'm going to go to the race this week just 
just to watch it because I was so impressed just what I saw with that one car. And again, those guys, that's hot rodders to me. They're doing what they've got to do to improve that car and go fast. It was really cool. And, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a Mazda, a Toyota, a 32 Ford or a 66 Chevelle, you know, we're all hot rodders doing the same thing. And before we wrap up, if we want to learn more, if we want to see more from Vintage Air, where can we find out? Best place is our website, vintageair.com. And we've got an 800 number, 800-862-6658 or sales at vintageair.com if you want to email. But the best place to always start is the, is the website. And But we've got guys on the phone all the time and more than happy to answer any questions or work through distributors like you. You know, you're targeting a certain group of people with what you're doing. I think that's a great idea. You're going to be in a better position to answer some of these questions than even our guys are because you have experience with these cars. Oh, you're too kind. <laughs> um, also, uh, Vintage Air also has an Instagram underscore Vintage Air as well. That's correct. Yep. And we're doing our own YouTube stuff now, too. We're getting a little better at that all the time, too. We're doing our own installation videos and all of that. So so even, even us old guys are trying to get a little better at that stuff. Well, Rick, just one more time. Thank you so much again. It's been a privilege. And yeah, definitely, I hope to meet in person. We can keep in touch. And then, yeah, expect yep. a lot more from me in development of my kit. Looking forward to it. Anything we can do to help, I'm right there with it because it's a whole new market for us and real excited about it. Really enjoyed the visit. Thanks very much for inviting us. That's it for this week's episode. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, as reviews really help support us. You can do it straight from your desktop. Don't even need an Apple device. This is Auto House Z. Thanks for all the support, you guys. Peace.